Well, in just three weeks, we'll be keeping the first holy day of God's Feast of Tabernacles. So this year, the holy days and the day of trumpets fall on a weekly Sabbath, makes it easier for travel and makes it easier for some of us as far as getting off work and, and getting back in time for school and that type of a thing. I want to begin over in Luke chapter 14 today, the parable of the Great Supper. It's important as we keep God's Feast of Tabernacles and as we look forward to a wonderful kingdom that's coming, that we understand we are here by invitation. As we read earlier, Jesus Christ said he chose us, we did not show, choose him. And in John 6 and verse 44, it says, none can come to him unless the Father draws him, and his purpose is to raise us up the last day. There are several very interesting parables in this, the Gospels about the Great Supper or a supper that a great man gave. So it must be important. It must be something that, that Jesus wants us to understand and understand clearly. Luke chapter 14, let's just begin in verse 1. It happened as he went into the house of one of the rulers of the Pharisees. So this is a man of the Sanhedrin, apparently. He was a ruler. He was uh, one of the 70 elders of Israel. So may he must have been, you know, a, fairly high up there in the religious hierarchy of the day, to eat bread on the Sabbath, and they watched him closely. So in other words, they were watching to see if Jesus would do something that in their mind would be the violation of the Sabbath, violation of one of their Sabbath rules. Behold, there was a certain man before him who had dropsy. And Jesus answering spoke to the lawyers and Pharisees, says, it is, law is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath day? But they kept silent. They did not know how to answer if it was lawful to heal or to do good on the Sabbath day. And it said, and let him go. And he answered and said, saying, which of you having a donkey or an ox that has fallen into a pit will not immediately pull him out on the Sabbath day? And they could not answer these things. They said, well, I guess we would. But they, again, simply held their tongue. They did not know how to answer what he could say. They could not answer him regarding these things. So he then gave this parable, and this parable is very important because the context we just read about was him asking them two questions they could not answer about lawful healing on the Sabbath day. He told them a parable to those who were invited when he noted how they chose the best places, saying, so first he noted to them that they had the best places in this room, apparently the, the tables were set in such a way or the seating was set in such a way that there were seats of honor, seats of not a, quite as much honor, and then what we used to call the nosebleed section or the, you know, the, the section for the average people. So he said to them that were choosing the best places for themselves, when you are invited by anyone to a wedding feast, do not sit down at the best place. The lesson for us here is obvious. We've all been invited to a wedding feast, but we are not here to take the best seats for ourselves lest one more honorable than you be invited by him. And he who invited you and have him come and say to you, give this place to this man, when you begin with shame to take the lowest place. But when you are invited, sit down at the lowest place to sit that when he who invited you comes to you, he might say, friend, go up higher. What he's showing here is that the man, the individual, who is the feast giver, is the one who decides where the places are where people are going to sit. And that's a good foundational beginning to understand the coming feast that Jesus has invited us all to, what we call the wedding supper. And by the way, there is, of course, controversy about the wedding supper, some involving some false teachings about the day of Pentecost. <laughs> the problem is, well, <clears throat> the, the answer is God does not tell us when or where the wedding supper takes place. And those who build entire doctrines on assuming for themselves they know something that they don't know by saying, well, the wedding supper must take place in heaven. It must take place right before Christ returns and it must take place. No, it doesn't. God is not bound by our human reason and our decisions about, about when we think something must happen. So let's just all agree that we don't know the location or the time of the wedding supper, but God does. And he will reveal that to us if we are going to be there. So the first, first lesson we learn here is that it is the responsibility of the man who gives the feast to decide when and where people are going to be sitting. Verse 11, whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. 
He also said to him who invited him, when you give a dinner or supper, so he's now talking to the host. So Jesus now turns his conversation, not from the entire group or from this group that shows the best seats for themselves. He's now talking to the host. And he said, when you give a dinner or a supper, do you not ask your friends, your brothers, your relatives, nor rich neighbors, lest they also invite you back and you be repaid? So when you give a nice dinner, you expect that in, in return, the same people will invite you to their dinner and when they have a feast or when they have a get together one night. And this happens quite often in neighborhoods and is still, I think, a fairly common thing in society. He says, but when you give a feast, invite the poor, the maimed, the lame, and the blind. Now, there's a proverb that says, if you give to the poor or loan to the poor, God himself is responsible to pay you back. And those who have put that to the test have found that God keeps his word in spades. But it does say very plainly here, when you give a feast, don't be concerned about how they might be able to reciprocate and give you a feast. You will be blessed because they cannot repay you. God's very plain about that. They will, you will be blessed because you give because they cannot repay you. For you shall be repaid at the resurrection of the just. So the resurrection of the just is a time of being, you might say, paid back or remunerated for good deeds of giving to the poor, for those who were maimed, those who were lame, and those who were blind. I know a first illustration of this, I think um, God guides and directs our lives, even going back many, many, many years. But the lovely young farm girl I married taught me some very valuable lessons, and still does. The one I'll never forget was that she said when she was in the hospital after her Mother and younger brother had, and grandmother had been killed in that terrible car crash with the train when my wife was nine, that she was laying in the hospital for a number of days because she had uh, some serious injuries, had glass going through her insides, had glass coming out the back of her head and the side of her head. She still had glass coming out of her head 30, 40 years later, I think, because hopefully it's all gone now. But she had to have one ear sewn back on. But she said, when I was in the hospital, and I was nine years old, the only friends of mine that came to see me were the little people of the school. It was the little people in the third grade or fourth grade, not the important people, not the good looking people, not all the really cool guys who thought all the girls loved them. She said it was always the little people that came and visited with us when we were in need. And so she said, that's what I wanna do as a wife and what we should do as a family. We wanna make sure that we give to those who are not able to give back and she's never forgotten that it was those, the simple little people that oftentimes are of the highest value in your life. So that I could talk for hours about the lessons my little farm girl wife has taught me, but um, don't have time for that right now. Maybe we'll give a couple sermons on it someday. So um, she sometimes gets very nervous so when I talk about her in a sermon, so I've got to be very, very careful. So I probably told you my final sermon as camp director that... Um, I got out a box of all the love letters she wrote me before we were married and started reading them to the campers, and she was about to come unglued. And uh, so, but Sean was there, Sean Robertson, and she was sitting next to Patty, and she said, don't worry, don't worry, or whatever she said, but she kept her in her seat. And I didn't read anything that was inappropriate, but I did read about our commitment together and what we wanted to accomplish. But at any rate, we have here something very important. When you give a feast, when you do good things, Remember the poor, the maimed, the blind, those who cannot pay you back because that's the way God will keep record and he will pay you back someday. Now that's the background for a very important parable, the first one we have record of about the wedding supper. Now when one of those who sat at the table heard him say these things, he said, blessed is it he who shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. So one of these Pharisees understood about there being a celebration dinner and eating together in the kingdom of God. So there were some who understood some pretty powerful truths even in the first century. So Jesus Christ answered him with a parable. A certain man gave a great supper and invited many. So this is obviously God the Father is giving a great supper and he invited many. And you are here today because you have been invited. Supper isn't here yet, but we are certainly hoping it'll be here soon. 
And he sent his servant at supper time to say to those who were invited, come, for all things are now ready. So there is a invitation moment when the announcement is made. Perhaps this is the seventh trumpet. We don't know exactly. But certainly there is a moment when, okay, it is time now to come to the wedding supper. But they all made with one accord began to make excuses. So maybe this verse 17 is more fulfilled at the time we receive the invitation, at the time when in this life we understand God's truth, we begin to understand the holy days, we begin to understand the kingdom of God and our need for repentance and forgiveness. Perhaps this invitation goes back a lot farther than just that one event. We'll have to wait and see. I think it certainly does. With one accord, people began to make excuses. The first said to him, well, I just bought a piece of ground, must go and see it. So he'd bought land, wanted to go see this new piece of land. The real estate he bought was more important than going to the wedding supper, than heeding the invitation. And the second one said, well, I just bought five yoke of oxen. That's 10 oxen. And oxen were not cheap. They were the Mercedes of their day. And so this would have been a great investment. And so the man would have said, well, I've got to go test these oxen out, see if they know how to plow a field and haul wagons and all the things that oxen were used to do. And I'm going to test them. I ask you to have me excused. So another said, I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. This is probably the most common reason over the years that we've heard of from people that understand the truth and apparently are being called but decide they simply cannot uh, abide by it right now because they can't follow the invitation because of their family situation. Verse 21, that servant came and reported these things to his masters. The servant comes in and says, well, I, I told all these people they were all invited, but we had all these excuses that we don't have enough people coming. And I, you know, the master of the servant of the house said to him, go out quickly into the streets and lanes of the city and bring in here the poor, the maimed, the lame, and the blind. Now that's the same group of people that he just told the Pharisees when they give a dinner, that's who you should invite. Okay, have you ever made that connection when reading this chapter? So there it is. He said, this, this is the example God has given. Now, the answer is, of course, that God has nothing. <laughs> we can't give God back anything. No matter what he gives to us, no matter what kind of dinner he throws, we can't invite him to a dinner. To, we can't pay him back. His grace, his eternal life is freely given. We cannot give him back anything on a par with what he's given to us. All we can do is obey and give him our life and our heart. So Jesus Christ said this wedding supper is made up of those who are called. They are spiritually speaking or maybe even in physical speaking. The poor, the maimed, the lame, and the blind. They cannot give anything back on the same level to the one who is throwing the dinner, who is hosting the dinner. And the servant said, well, master, it is done as you commanded. So he went out and collected all of these, and they said there is still room. And the master said to the servant, go out into the highways and the hedges and compel them to come. You know, make them come. Grab them by the shirt collar and drag them in or threaten them. There is some thought this actually refers to the part of the Great Tribulation where the Laodicean church has to decide, being tried with fire, whether they are going to obey God or not. So they're going to be compelled to come in. Notice that my house may be filled. So the supper, the wedding supper, needed to be filled. It was not one to where there was going to be empty seats allowed. For I say to you that none of those who were invited shall taste my supper. Now perhaps he's referring there to the people of Judah of that time, where of course he said some of them would be in the lake of fire, but I think he's referring to those who were being called, like some of those Pharisees in that room, who were rejecting his invitation because of personal reasons. I read you, I'm going to read a little tiny section out of Harper's Encyclopedia of Bible Life, I think one of the better commentaries or better books illustrating the uh, everyday life in Bible times, you might say. Um, this section's on the wedding. He says, probable, this is, by the way, is page 101. Probable also is that the meeting place of the two parties immediately became the scene of much traditional singing, dancing, reciting, of love poems accompanied by musical instruments. This is in the procession where the bride goes to meet, uh, the, the, the groom goes to meet his bride and bring her back to the place that he has prepared for her. He said that we have the bride was heavily veiled and remained so until the marriage was consummated that night. 
He says, <clears throat> from the evidence cited above, it appears the relatives and close friends of both bride and bridegroom during the procession and at the feast at the bridegroom's house treated the couple as if they were indeed queen and king for the day. I think that's interesting also. Beneath the outward gaiety and ecstasy, however, lay a deeper significance of the journey together to the bridegroom's house. Now the bride has passed from the authority of her father to that of her husband. Now the process began with the negotiations and carried on through the betrothal has been completed. He is now her Lord and master. The true wedding feast followed the arrival of the bride and the bridegroom at the latter's house, which might but be a room in his father's house, depending on the finances and blessings of the family. At the feast, wine flowed. Remember Jesus Christ at the Passover night said he would not take wine again until he does it with us in his kingdom. So that may be the fulfillment of that. Said there was more music making, dancing, singing, asking of riddles, and other simple forms of enjoying mixed company. The celebration lasted for a week, if we may generalize from Genesis 29, Judges 14, and also the wedding feast of John chapter 2, which was the location of Christ's first miracle, turning water into wine. Now, if you look at these excuses that are given in chapter 14 in Luke, First is the ground or house or my physical possessions. The next thing is oxen or my work, my, my, the way I make a living, what I do. Next is family issues. You might say, in other words, in their mind, the timing wasn't right. They were going to wait until everything was perfect in their life before deciding to obey the call, the invitation that they had been given. Sadly, those, there's not a second chance given. The second chance theory is simply wrong. I want to go over to Hebrews chapter 6, uh, certainly not the most pleasant verse to read, but it is encouraging in the sense to know that the invitation of God is serious. The invitation from God is not something to be treated lightly. It is not something to be put off until it is convenient and easy. Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 1, therefore leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ, let us go on to perfection. So there are elementary principles, there is a foundation that we have to understand. He lists those for us, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works, faith towards God, baptisms, laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, which is a very important truth, and of eternal judgment, that once you are judged, it is eternal. If you are a spirit being, that means you're going to be a spirit being in God's family forever. If you are judged as being rebellious and defiant and not willing to heed the call, then as it says in Malachi, you'll be ashes under the feet of the righteous. He says, this we will do, meaning we will go on to perfection if God permits. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened. Now, does that mean they were given the invitation? They were once enlightened. They now understand, wow, lights come on. I understand God's holy days. I understand God is not a trinity. I understand that God, man is not an immortal soul. I understand the truth about repentance and, and obeying God. I understand what John the Baptist said, that repent, the time is hand, the kingdom of God is here. So when people are enlightened, if they have tasted the heavenly gift, then they become partakers of the Holy Spirit, which God said opens our mind to understand truth and gives us help in time of need. And they have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come. So I think in this verse, it indicates they really have had God's spirit and used it to advantage in overcoming sin. But if they fall away, it is impossible to renew them again to repentance. In other words, there is not a second chance. There is not a second or a third invitation to the wedding supper. If they fall away, they shall not be it simply shall not be allowed. There simply is no second chance. Since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put into open shame. That describes, I think, for us the, the process when Christ said that those who were shut out of the, Matthew 25, shut out of the wedding supper because their lamps had gone out. In other places, he talks about weeping and gnashing of teeth. That when the door is shut, the door is shut. Let him who is righteous be righteous still. Let him who is unrighteous be unrighteous still, as it mentions in the book of Revelation. So we have, I think, a warning here. There's also, you know, kind of a the wonderful understanding of the wedding supper and the invitation to God's wedding supper has with it this, you know, sort of a warning that the wedding supper invitation is only given one time. 
I want to go down to Matthew chapter 13. Interesting about Matthew 13, obviously the most famous chapter in the New Testament about parables. It is, uh, what I think there are four parables in this chapter, very important parables. But one of the most important, or one of the most well-known, of course, is the parable of the sower, the man who went out to sow seed. As we look at this sowing seed, let's consider it in the context of this is an invitation. This is the invitation to come to God's supper. It says, verse 3, he spoke many things in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and the birds came and devoured it. Some fell on stony places where they did not have much earth, and they immediately sprang up, and they had no depth of earth. When the sun was up, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. Verse 7 is the third category. Some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up and choked them. Thorns are weeds. Others fell on good ground and yielded a crop, some a hundredfold, some 60, some 30. Now, the common thing here is that the seed never changes. The invitation, the message does not change. The only thing that changes is the dirt, is where the seed happens to fall. And so it is not a different message for different people. It's not different strokes for different folks. It is the same stroke for all folks. It is simply a matter of how they respond. And so when we consider this wedding invitation, we have to ask ourselves, what kind of dirt am I? What kind of reception did I give to God's message, to God's invitation? And so we have this, I think, very illustrative, uh, very easy to illustrate, very easy to understand parable that Jesus Christ gave to people who sowed seed. They knew what it was like to plant seed, to foul their ground, and to hope for a harvest. And they also knew what it was to have the, uh, the crows come or the birds come and devour seed away. And they also knew about seeds that are choked off by weeds. You know, the, uh, you know, there's the old, the old saying, in fact, if you've, if you've studied much about gardening and after making a lot of mistakes in gardening, I started, started doing a little bit more research. But one of the first rules of gardening is don't let your seeds, your weeds go to seed. And you have dandelions, you have all these other seeds that come in there the important thing is you don't let your weeds go to seed. You get, them, you get rid of them first. The other thing is that my wife, my father-in-law told me one time, my wife's father, that everything you grow in the garden, there's a weed that looks just like it. And boy, that's true. There are weeds that look just like tomato plants when they're coming up. There are weeds that look like carrots when they're coming up. There are weeds that look like beans. They're just weeds that are just slightly different than all these vegetables. And it takes a little bit of keen perception to know which one to pull up and which one not to. So we've all pulled up vegetables thinking they were weeds, and we've also let weeds grow that we knew we sh later we should have taken out. So there's also a weed we had this year in our garden that looks so much like a potatoes coming up. I thought, how can there be a weed that looks like a potato plant coming up? But there are. So Satan is very deceptive. His message, he, he can disguise it so it looks a lot like God's message but it simply is not. You cannot let those seeds go, those plants grow to full and then scatter seeds around your garden because the next year you'll have nothing but weeds everywhere. I want to be over to the book of Haggai now. It's, Haggai is such an interesting, very short, you know, two chapters, just basically two and a half pages in your Bible. There's not much to it as far as length goes, but it is full of these little pithy statements. It's almost like a Remember the movie, The Fiddler on the Roof, and all these classical statements that are in there? Oh, he's starting to talk like a man, and God made so many poor people, he must love them. Or, you know, God, I heard that being rich is a curse. May I be cursed and never recover. Remember, I just love the Fiddler on the Roof movie. It's, so, it's just full of so many little one-wordy, wow, that's, that, that, that means a lot, these memorable sentences. Well, the book of Haggai is almost like that. There are so many just one sentence or two sentence pithy statements in here that you cannot digest everything by reading through it very quickly. I want to begin in verse 1 because Haggai was sent to the Jews in Jerusalem who had returned from Babylonian captivity at a time when they needed some encouragement to finish their job. They had started, they had rebuilt at least the floor of the temple and they had the altar up so they could do sacrifices but they had the foundation, but they did not finish the house. The house sat there for at least 16 years, some say as long as perhaps 22. So God sent Haggai and Zephaniah to them and said, please 
uh, not please, but <clears throat> you must finish the work that you've been called to do. I think there is a com at least a, a connection here because we've had the foundation of God's new temple for many, many years, and we are heading towards the final completion of this era, I believe, of this 6,000 years of mankind. And it's time for us to make sure we are not, we're not getting taken, uh, taken in by the same problems that caused them to neglect building their temple back in the 400s, late, early 400s BC. In the second year of King Darius, in the sixth month, on the first day of the month, the word of the Lord came to Haggai. So this is probably about 521 B.C. The prophet Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, the governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest. So Zerubbabel, we know about from the book of Ezra. He was the governor, the civil governor appointed by Darius. And then we have Joshua, actually I think he may have been appointed by Cyrus, but this is now Darius is in charge, is the king of, of Persia. And then we have Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest. So they knew they had to have a civil government and an established church, an established religious authority in order to have a functioning nation, in order to reestablish Judaism and to have the temple service be completed and be continuing on. Thus says the Lord of hosts, this people says the time has not come, the time has not come to build the Lord's house. So he said, these people are putting away, putting to the side the building of God's house. Then the word of the Lord came to Haggai the prophet saying, is it time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses and this temple to lie in ruins? So they had their houses finished, either with plaster on the walls or wood paneling of some kind. And yet the house of God that was supposed to be built wasn't quite done. Is it time for you to dwell in your, your paneled houses? Now, therefore, thus says the Lord, verse 5, consider your ways. You have sown much and you bring in little. That's a pretty pithy statement. You've worked hard, but you're not being blessed for it. You're sowing really hard. You're sowing much, bringing in little, but you eat, but have not enough. You drink, but you're not filled with drink. You clothe yourselves, but you're not warm. So all of your physical efforts here to take care of your life are being stymied because I'm not blessing you. And he who earns wages, earns wages to put it into a bag with holes. Another pithy statement. I think in our colloquialisms, we say that uh, money speaks and it says goodbye. And there are a few other ones that uh, they talk about. But he who earns wages, earns wages to put it into a bag with holes. So God withheld his blessing from them because they were not finishing the temple like they were supposed to. Thus says the Lord God of hosts, consider your ways, go up to the mountains and bring wood and build the temple that I may take pleasure in it and be glorified. You looked for much, but indeed it came to little. And when you brought it home, I blew it away. So God says he blew it away because they were focused on their own life, their own temple, their own houses, their own oxen, as the one man in Luke 14 said, he says, because of my house that is in ruins, while well, every one of you runs to his own house. Now, if you studied the Temple of Solomon, at least read, read the Bible and scriptures on it in Kings and Chronicles, the Temple of Solomon was a type of God's family, really God's church. We are a spiritual temple. Jesus Christ is our foundation, and the foundation stones already laid are the writings of the apostles and the prophets. But how long did Solomon's temple take to build? He began to build in the fourth year of his reign, and he finished it in what year? This is, this is trivia. You, don't, you know all the answers. You're disqualified. No, I'm just kidding. If nobody else knows the answers, then we'll call on Nathan. Okay, the answer is seven. Now, is that sort of interesting that it took seven years to build God's temple? And there are seven eras of God's church in the book of Revelation, chapters two and three. And there are other indications about sevens all through the seven candlesticks in the temple of God, the showbread, so many other things. So if we are in, getting near the end of the 6,000 years, then perhaps we are more in the time of Haggai than we know, that it is time to begin to finish the house of God and get it ready for the return of Christ, because the final end to building the temple of God will be at the end of the millennium, and of course the second resurrection, the time pictured by the eighth or the last great day. Let's continue on down. He says in verse 10, Therefore the heavens above you are withhold the dew, and the earth is fruit. He says, I call for a drought on the land and the mountains, on the grain and the new wine and oil, 
on whatever the ground brings forth, on men and livestock and all the labor in your hands. So all of these reasons given by the men in Luke 14 for not heeding the call to the wedding supper were already reasoned, fulfilled in the time of Haggai, that the people of Israel, the Jews who were there, people of Judah, were going back and turning their back on this job they had to do, this invitation given to them, so to speak, for the same reasons. Then Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the words of Haggai the prophet. And the Lord their God had sent them, and the people feared in the presence of God. So they publicly repented. They publicly acknowledged that they had been neglecting building God's temple and instead had been working on their own things. Then Haggai, the Lord's messenger, that's who Haggai is. He's the Lord's messenger spoke the Lord's message to the people saying, I am with you, says the Lord. So God answered through Haggai, I am with you. The Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Sheltiel, the governor of Judah, the spirit of Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people. And they came and worked on the house of the Lord of hosts, their God. So what the church of God needs is some stirring up. We need to ask God to stir us up because notice the Lord stirred them up. We can't work it up ourselves. There are sales organizations and some of those uh, modern pop psychologists that think you can just jump up and down and tell yourself, you know, get excited, get excited, and you'll be excited, that kind of thing. I, one of my first jobs out of college, one of, the, one of the six I had my first year married to my wife, so she knew she had a winner and things were going to be great. But um, it was an insurance sales company down in Texas. We only had a few months before we had to move. And one of their mottos was, act enthusiastic and you'll be enthusiastic. So you can just kind of work it up. And we were supposed to take cold showers in the morning so we get our blood flowing. So, you know, that doesn't work unless there's a real value inside you and a hope and a purpose. You can't just act somehow and cause it magically to happen. So the spirit being stirred up has to come from God. The Lord stirred up their spirit. And each one of us should pray that God would stir up our spirit so that we can seek him completely, thoroughly, and make good use of the short time that we have left. Verse 3, let's chapter 2. Now, verse 3 simply mentions, Is there any among you who saw this temple in its former glory? Talking about the temple of Solomon. And how you see it now in comparison with it is not in your eyes nothing. These people would have been in their 70s. Uh, it would have been about 60, what, 4, 68 years earlier. They've been taken to captivity. So these, maybe they were 77, 78, somewhere along that line. We don't know. Instead of being discouraged because our church is small, or our resources are few, those among us are not as powerful and as smart and as wealthy and all those things as we'd like to be perhaps. We don't have everything, all the tools we'd like to do. But God says in verse 4, just like they were disappointed in their physical resources to build their little temple, he says, Be strong, Zerubbabel, and say, says the Lord, and be strong, Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest. Be strong, all you people of the land, says the Lord, and work. In other words, be strong and get back to work. For I am with you, says the Lord. According to verse 5, according to the word that I covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt, so my spirit remains among you, do not fear. So that covenant they made with God coming out of Egypt, brokered by Moses, they were still held to. Just like it says in Romans, the covenant still apply to Israel and Judah. Both of them are mentioned. So this covenant was with them, and God says, don't worry, I will fulfill my part. And then it turns into an end-time philosophy, end-time prediction, just like Mr. Albright showed in his sermon out on, on uh, chapter 10 of Isaiah. It sort of switches gear, yet it, it applies in their time and in our time. For thus says the Lord of hosts, once more, in a little while, now, in a little while, in 521 B.C., is a whole lot different than it's going to happen in a little while in 2023. Our little while is a whole lot littler than theirs was at that time. But in a little while, God says, I will shake heaven and earth, the sea and the dry land. It's going to be a massive earthquake of society and probably of the earth itself also. I will shake all nations. It's never happened yet. 
but it is going to. God says, I will shake all nations and they shall come to the desire of all nations. But they will only desire their savior after a lot of suffering and a lot of punishment, a lot of bloodshed. And after they realize humans ways, human decisions, rejecting God has caused all of that. So they will come to the desire of all nations and I will fill this temple with glory. So this temple they were building seemed small, seemed insignificant, seemed like nothing in comparison to Solomon's, but it was a type of the church that God is building. It's a type of the church that he is building and will last for all time. Why? Because verse 9 says, The glory of this latter temple shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place I will give peace. So Jesus Christ said, Peace I leave with you. Peace I give you, and in this place he will give peace to all the earth. So the book ends, it's kind of interesting, verse 21. It ends with the reminder of the same message. Speaks to Zerubbabel, the governor of Judah, saying, I will shake heaven and earth. I will overthrow the throne of kingdoms. I will destroy the strength of the Gentile kingdoms. I will overthrow the chariots and those who ride in them, and the horses and their riders shall come down. Everyone by the sword to his brother. And in that day, says the Lord of hosts, I will take you, Zerubbabel, my servant, the son of Shealtiel, says the Lord, and will make you a signet ring, for I have chosen you, says the Lord of hosts. Now, what's a lot of interesting things about that and how it could be fulfilled prophetically, but Zerubbabel was the civil administrator. He was the governor. He was not the high priest. That was Joshua. So we have God telling this man, this being who had been chosen by Cyrus, or by, I'm sorry, by Darius, to be the governor there, and he was saying, you're going to be like a signet ring to me. Well, obviously, Zerubbabel will be in the resurrection, I would assume, but I don't think he's the one that is going to be the signet ring. The signet ring will be on the hand of the one who rules the earth. It's on, the signet ring is on the hand of the king. So Zerubbabel is a type of Jesus Christ who will build his temple just like Zerubbabel was building the one during his time. And so we have this invitation that these people rejected because they were too busy with their own lives and all of the distractions of it. But they repented, and they did finish the temple in a small way in comparison to the the fabulous palace of Solomon. However, God says this little building that you are building in these times of fewer resources, fewer numbers, and certainly fewer, less, much less power than Solomon's, this temple is going to be even more glorious and will essentially last for all time. I want to go over to Matthew chapter 22 now, another parable, another chapter about this, uh, another parable about the wedding supper. Matthew 22, let's begin in verse 1. This is what they very much understood because Marriages during that time were arranged by the parents. Now, there, there was input. The young man could tell his father, I see a, a, I'm getting to know this young lady. I really like her. Can we get married? One example of that, of course, was Samson, who simply lusted after a girl. But he went to his parents, and they were able to arrange the marriage between the families. But in this case, Jesus answered and spoke to them again by parables and said, The kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who arranged a marriage for his son. This is very transparent. It's easy to understand this is God the Father calling people to be the bride for his son. And he sent out his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding, but they were not willing to come. And again, he sent out other servants saying, tell those who are invited, see, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and fatted cattle and killed all things and killed and all things are ready. So it's going to be a big feast. Come to the wedding. But they made light of it and went their own ways. One to his own farm one to his own business. And the rest, those who didn't leave, were even more spiteful than that. They seized his servants, treated them spitefully, and killed them. That happened to God's prophets ever since the time of the judges. That happens to to God's true ministers ever since the time of Jesus Christ himself walking the earth. And that 11 of his 12 disciples all came to violent, premature deaths. The only one that didn't, apparently, was the Apostle John. But this was fulfilled in the subsequent years right after this, and it has been off and on ever since. When the king heard it, he was furious, 
And he sent out his armies and destroyed those murderers and burned up their city. And he said to his servants, the wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. So this could be a a lesson about the transition from God's message going to just the Judahites or Israelites to going to all the earth, all nations. So there are a number of applications that might be possible here. Therefore, go into the highways, and as many as you find, invite to the wedding. So they were inviting now many other people, not just those who were in that city where the invitation was first given. So those servants went out to the highways and gathered together all whom they found, both good and bad. And the wedding hall was filled with guests. So every seat was filled as the one who gave the wedding feast dictated. But now here's a little, little, you might say, additional twist to this. When the king came in to see the guests, he saw men there who did not have on a wedding garment. So someone tried to get in, but was not properly dressed. And he said to him, friend, how did you come in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless, just like the Pharisees were speechless when he asked them about healing on the Sabbath day. So the king said to the servants, bind him hand and foot, take him away and cast him into outer darkness. And there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So he tried to sneak in without having the linen, the white linen garments of righteousness, And of course, there simply was no choice except he was be thrown out into outer darkness with weeping and gnashing of teeth. And he ends this parable by saying, many are called, but few are chosen. So we've been called to God's feast. We've been called to this wedding supper. We go to the Feast of Tabernacles to get a vision of that, to understand that more clearly, to appreciate more the invitation that we've been given, to picture the time when we'll be together, with our Savior, who will at that time be our King and will be ruling all the earth and will gain a greater appreciation for this marvelous invitation that we've all been given.